So as, as uh, Nicole's just said, um, I'm going to be talking today about do to stop eating and dairy in order to tackle climate change. So the first thing to note, uh, trying to change the slide. The slide change isn't working. So somebody changed them for me. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, so the first thing to know is that food. I have a delay. OK, food accounts for um, just over a quarter of all our greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. So um, what you hear most about in the news is you hear about industry and en energy generating all of our greenhouse gas emissions. What most people don't realize is what we eat actually contributes a quarter of those emissions. And most of those are from uh, activities on the farm. It includes things like food transport and refrigeration. But most of these are activities associated with growing the food and raising animals. So that's 26% of all emissions on the planet shown in this top bar here. Uh, 26% of all our emissions on the planet are from food. If we take those emissions, a staggering 58% are from animal products, despite animal protein only representing 18% of all the protein that we consume. So there's a disproportionate impact of animal products on our greenhouse gas emissions from the food system. And of these animal products, beef and lamb represent about a half of those. So beef and lamb, because they're ruminants, uh, that means they're animals that digest uh, grass predominantly. And their digestive system produces methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. So they burp methane as they grow and as they eat um, up to 200 or 300 litres a day uh, for cattle. And that methane is a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate warming. So 50% of all animal product emissions are from beef and lamb alone. So this isn't crank science, this is settled science. This is well known. So much so that the committee, UK Committee on Climate Change, which recommends uh, what the government needs to do to hit its net zero targets by 2050, is that we need to cut meat and dairy consumption by at least 20% and reduce food waste by 20%. And Chris Stark said um, in a recent interview with the BBC, uh, we can't meet the government's 2050 net zero targets without major changes to the way we use land, the way we farm and what we eat. So this is by no means a fringe view. This is settled science, which is making its way into policy. And some of you may have seen the headlines in the newspapers this morning, two of the, new, uh, two of the national newspapers um, carried the news about number 10 considering a carbon tax and a carbon tax if implemented across all sectors of the economy on food and agriculture as well would push up particularly the price of meat and dairy so we could see some price hikes associated with meat and dairy which will uh, come if a carbon tax is introduced as a way of meeting our net zero target. So the difference between animal products and plant-based products is quite, quite stark. If you look at this graph that's shown on the left over here, um, you can see these are the greenhouse gas emissions in kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of product. What we can see here is that extensive beef production and sheep production are emitting round about 50 to 60 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of product. And that is largely due to the methane that they emit during their lifetime, as I explained earlier. If we compare that to over to the right, so these are the pulses and beans uh, and meat substitutes made of plant material, you can see that there are orders of magnitude differences between uh, the per kilogram uh, emissions from vegetable products and the per kilogram emissions from meat products. So ruminant meat 
um, so that's cattle and sheep again to remind you, has a climate impact between about 10 to 100 times greater than plant-based foods. So we're not talking about 10% greater or 100% greater double, we're talking 100 times the climate impact. So no small difference. So there's a really disproportionate impact of animal-based products on the greenhouse gas emissions that we uh, emit from our diets. So a shift from this position A, if we can see a lot of products in these categories and few products in these categories, we shift over to consuming more products in these categories and less of these, we can have a really significant impact on the emissions associated with our food and therefore the climate impact. In an analysis that compares different diets, um, uh, this analysis uh, by Alex Alexander Vesh and, uh, and colleagues uh, looked at vegan diets, vegetarian diets, uh, Mediterranean diets, redu reduced meat diets, and just your regular diets. And what they found was that the vegan diets in particular had uh, about a, a difference of between sort of 40 and 50 percent relative to the uh, normal diet, the normal um, diet that we eat um, around the world, which is fairly meat intensive. And diets also a reduced um, climate footprint, a Mediterranean diet, a reduced climate footprint, and reduced meat diets can have a small impact too. Whilst vegan diets have the lowest impact and vegetarian diets the next, uh, that it just shows that all reductions in meat and dairy deliver climate benefits. So I don't want people going away from this uh, talk thinking the, the only way to tackle the climate problem is to become vegan. Um, not many people are willing to make that once in a lifetime decision, I'm never going to eat animal products again. But more people may consider reducing the amount of meat and dairy that they consume every day, for example, by having a meat free day, a meat free two days, or reducing the amount of meat that they have on the plates, or reducing the meat that's in, in their meals. So the key takeaway message from this is everyone can make a difference. Those people willing and able to become vegetarian or vegan, that obviously offers the greatest benefit to the climate, but everyone can a difference uh, by reducing meat you can have a positive impact on the climate. So I did some calculations looking at what this might look like. I used um, the carbon footprint cap that's available um, online and I just put in um, I didn't put in anything else apart from diet. So I put in a vegan diet um, and a heavy meat diet. A heavy meat diet is one that is sort of reflected in most people who are eating uh, uh, just sort of normally when, when they're eating meat more or less every day. The startling finding from doing this calculation is that if, if you don't account for any emissions at all, no driving, no, uh, no flying, uh, no house eating, nothing at all, the heavy meat diet alone would push you over the target that we have for a fair share of emissions per person. So if we look at the amount that's allowed per person, there's about tons of CO2 equivalent per year, would be the fair share globally. If everybody were allowed to emit two tons, we could potentially get to the 1.5 or two degree uh, climate targets as set in the Paris Agreement if we were to stay within this limit. This shows the heavy meat diet alone will exceed those worldwide per capita emissions that are required to combat climate change. A vegan diet, on the other hand, uh, produces about 0.88 tonnes of CO2 per year, well below that target um, of two tonnes of CO2. And of course, the other emissions from your traveling and from heating your house and everything would um, would top up this amount here. But I just calculated the difference just to see, just to put it in the context of uh, other things, the difference between a vegan diet and the heavy meat diet is one CO2 equivalents per year. 
and that's equivalent to two return flights from Edinburgh to Malaga every year. So whilst we often think about, so oh, maybe we shouldn't uh, use a flight, maybe we shouldn't should travel less, maybe we should fly less, and that is of course the case, um, most people don't realize that their diet, what they eat every day, contributes as much as uh, up to two, two uh, return flights from Scotland to Spain uh, every year. So that's just to put it in context of the amount of greenhouse gases that it emits. It's a really significant difference. But it's not only the climate that is benefited by switching to more, more, more plant-based diets. Um, this is a study which looked at the impact, not just on climate change. I've showed you the real results already for climate change, but we can also look at land use, energy use, air quality, and water quality. And if we look at the, uh, uh, the impact of ruminant-based meat shown here at the bottom, compared to the plant-based products at the top, again, we see there's about a factor of 100 difference in climate change impact, in the land use change impact, the amount of land that's required to produce a unit of product, the energy that's used to produce that product, the consequent pollution effect on air quality and the pollution effect on water quality. So switching towards small plant-based diets compared to the animal-based diets will help the climate, it will spare land, it will reduce pollution and it will reduce energy use. So it's not a matter of a trade-off between climate change and some of these other factors. They all pull in the same direction and all of the environmental impacts tell us that the fewer livestock products we eat, the better we will be, the better will be our impact on the environment. It's not just um, climate change and the environmental impacts I've shown um, uh, that, that, that are affected by diets too. So type two diabetes, coronary heart disease, and other chronic non-communicable diseases are related to an overconsumption of animal products, particularly red meats and processed meats. And it's been extensively, and it's been um, been accepted more widely um, in the medical uh, medical profession. This example um, is from uh, the uh, the journal Lancet Oncology, uh, which published the study, um, which showed the car carcinogenicity, the um, cancer risk, in other words, of red and processed meats, being about 18% higher risk of colorectal cancer. And that's equivalent to about one in 100 people associated with red and processed meats. So it's better for the planet, and it's also better for your health to consume less livestock products in your diets. But as I mentioned earlier on, it also, um, uh, animal agriculture also uses a lot of land. Over 30% of the crops that we grow on the planet are fed to livestock rather than humans, and then we consume the livestock products. That's hugely inefficient. If we were to use that 30% of crops and fed that to humans, that would be a far more efficient way of doing it. In fact, if we um, reduce livestock product consumption, it would free up grasslands, of course, but it would also free up a large amounts of cropland, which could be used to grow food for humans rather than for animals. So eating less meat and dairy frees up that land and we can use it for other things. For example, protecting biodiversity and tackling climate change. When we grow plants, they remove carbon dioxide, which is the most important greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. So we can use that land to plant up uh, forests or other vegetation, which can be used as a carbon sink to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and to tackle climate change. So food production and using the land for climate change, for creating carbon sinks go and the more pressure we take off the land by reducing our consumption of livestock products, the less pressure there is on the land from agriculture and the more land we can use 
for nature-based solutions like protecting peatlands and woodlands, restoring degraded peatlands and woodlands, better managing woodlands and soils and creating new native woodland, which doesn't only help uh, climate change, but it also helps biodiversity. There's a couple of things to note though about this. Um, even if we free up land, the land can't do it all. So there's not enough land to soak up emissions from all other sectors, like transport and energy generation, aviation, etc. So even by changing our diets and using nature-based solutions, that is not a get out of jail free card for doing nothing else about climate change. We need to take immediate, immediate and aggressive action in all sectors of the economy if, to, if we're to meet net zero targets. And not all land-based solutions are necessarily good for biodiversity. So they need to be chosen and implemented carefully to get those multiple benefits. But if implement, implemented carefully, nature-based solutions are good for biodiversity, they're good for people, and they're good for both climate change, mitigation adapt, and adaptation. So they improve resilience to future climate change and they also reduce greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So in a little study that was performed for WWF, uh, the World Wildlife Fund and the RSPB, we did a little calculation about what nature-based solutions would provide um, to our net zero targets. And we found that together, um, protection of peatlands and woodlands the restoration of degraded peatlands and woodlands and coastal systems, the management of woodlands and soils better, and the creation of new, new woodlands with native trees could provide an, an additional um, 75 to 123 megatons of CO2 equivalents, millions of tons of CO2 equivalents by, uh, by 2030, and between 278 and over 400 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalents by 2050. So the land really does have an important role to play in our net zero target, both from reducing emissions from the food system, which is the thing that I discussed early on in the presentation, and also by freeing land to use for other, um, other forms of ecosystem restoration, which sucks up carbon from the atmosphere and can, be a, can also be used to tackle climate change. The other thing that reducing animal product consumption does is it creates headspace for less intensive forms of agriculture. The reason we're on this headlong express, uh, express journey towards more and more intensive agriculture is because we are currently doing it very inefficiently because we rely on animals to provide our protein. Most of the protein that we consume on the planet is actually from plant-based products, not from proteins. And there's a myth that we can only get that protein from animal sources. In fact, proteins uh, are largely supplied uh, by plants on this planet. So by switching towards um, more plant-based diets, we can shift the way that we do agriculture. I used to say, I've got colleagues who, who, who promote organic agriculture, and I used to say to them, I don't think ag organic agriculture will be able to feed the planet because the yields are lower, where we don't use any uh, uh, products that control pests and, and herbicides and pesticides, uh, for example. Um, so organic agriculture can't feed the world. But in fact, we showed in this paper uh, by Muller et al. Um, in 2017 that we can feed everybody on the planet using organic agriculture. But we can only do that if we have a rap radical reduction in animal product consumption and the elimination of animal feeds that could be fed to humans. So that's not, not feeding the 30% uh, of crops that we feed to, currently feed to animals we feed those instead to humans. We grow products on those that humans could eat. And it shows that we could have a much, a, a much different future, a brighter future for agriculture, one that's more harmonious and more agroecological, and one that 
more is more in harmony with nature rather than working against it as happens when you uh, push towards ever more intensive and input intensive agriculture but this can only be achieved if we shift the balance of products that we have in our diets. So in conclusion, uh, food production and distribution contra con contributes up to a third of greenhouse gas emissions emitted by humans. The value I showed on the first slide was 26%. Livestock production is responsible for 58% of all emissions from agriculture, and half of those emissions come from ruminants such as cattle and sheep. Ruminant meat has 10 to 100 times worse impact on the climate than plant-based foods, as well as 100, 10 to 100 times greater impact on land use, water use, air pollution, and water pollution. So I think we need to redesign the food system to produce food that is healthy and sustainable. Remember that eating less animal products is generally better for our health and better for the environment. And that means lower meat consumption and halving food loss and waste, as well as, in, well as improving the efficiency of production. So I would say, in, in summary, if you want to make a difference, eat less meat and dairy and eat more fruit and veg. It doesn't mean you have to go all the way to becoming a, veg, a vegan or a vegetarian. Everyone can make a difference by changing the way they eat. I'll leave it there, and then we've got a lot more time for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. My video switched on. There we go. Um, thank you so much, Pete, for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've had a lot of great questions, comments flooding in um, in the chat section, so it's good we've got plenty of time to get through that. <laughs> so um, I will kick off. So Michelle is asking, how much carbon gets sequestered in ruminant production? Uh, this is a controversial question. Uh, I would say that not very much. There's a movement um, out there called the holistic gra grazing movement, which claims that moving the animals around in a herd type way, so you, you keep them concentrated in a small area and move them around frequently, increases the soil carbon sequestration. But there's very little evidence that that is the case, very little scientific evidence. The thing about grasslands is they're very high end. So there's not very much carbon you can do. You think of carbon sequestration as like filling up a bucket. Grasslands like, are like a bucket that's almost full. So you really can't get much more carbon in the top. It just starts to flow over the side. So it can, they already contain quite a lot of carbon. So there's not much additional carbon that you can get in them. I think some of the confusion arises because grasslands contain a lot of carbon. So the stock of carbon is very high. They contain a large amount of carbon. But carbon sequestration is the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's the net annual removal. So that's a, a removal per year. So it's a rate of removal. And that can, you can have a high stock of carbon, but your actual sequestration rate can be zero. So because the bucket's already full, basically. So there's limited, limited, um, limited evidence that the increase or ruminant uh, production increases soil carbon. But there's a lot of evidence, well, we know for a fact that they emit large amounts of greenhouse gases and um, uh, predominantly methane. And that methane is a potent greenhouse gas, much more potent, in fact, than carbon dioxide. Um, Leslie says, can we be clear about where the figures are coming from for meat industry? UN figures include land clearance, transport, and an intensive system. They are not based on local buying and grass grazed beef. Um, no. Um, when you look at the carbon footprint, the vast majority, 80 to 90 percent of the carbon footprint, is from the methane emissions from the cattle. Very, very little of it is from transport um, and those are other aspects of the life cycle. So whilst there are many, many good reasons to buy local, 
I think it's great. I try to buy locally as well. In terms of climate change, that's a relatively small component of the total life cycle emissions. So if, if you ask me, is it better to buy beef locally or to buy plant-based products that have been imported, shipped in from across the world? The answer is unequivocally, it's better to in, import uh, plant-based products because the greenhouse gas footprint of the transport is so much lower than the greenhouse gas footprint of the emissions of methane from the cattle. Thank you very much. Um, Rochelle, how long does methane last in the environment? I can't hear you. Can you talk a second, please? Sorry, I'll say that again. It just broke up there. Um, how long does methane last in the environment? So methane has got a, an atmospheric lifetime of about 12 years. So it's a shorter lived greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. So um, methane, whilst it's being emitted, so you can, you can sort of think of it as like a sort of a flow greenhouse gas. It's constantly being emitted, but it's constantly being broken down. So if you emit a unit of methane today, within 12 years, that unit of methane will largely be broken down and it's broken down into carbon dioxide. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Um, Rochelle, how long but when we compare, um, so, so one, one, if we follow that logic through, um, you might say that methane is not an important greenhouse gas because it doesn't last very long. But on the other hand, you might say that because we want to meet net zero by 2050, we've got only 30 years to do that. We're at 2020 already. Methane should be a target of our mitigation action because acting on it, we can have really, really quick turnaround on the methane emissions. The reality is that we have to reduce methane emissions and carbon dioxide. So the idea that we can say, let's not worry about methane, we only have to worry about carbon dioxide is ridiculous. But it's also ridiculous to say, um, uh, we, we, we really, really uh, have to reduce methane at the expense of carbon dioxide. Uh, the answer is we have to do both and we have to do so really rapidly. Great, thank you very much. Um, Samantha's asking, why does poultry and pork produce less CO2 than beef and sheep? Can you say, can you lean into your mic a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, why does poultry and pork produce less CO2 than beef and sheep? Yeah, it produces less methane. So all of those um, graphs show CO2 equivalents, which convert methane and nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide into the same unit. So they don't emit less CO2, but they emit less methane. In fact, they emit very little methane. Like us, they just have a single stomach, which digests food aerobically, so oxygen is present. So when we break down food, um, it produces carbon dioxide. Than methane. The ruminants have a, a four chamber digestive system called a rumen. That's where the ruminant name comes from. And that's anaerobic digestion. They've got an um, organism called archaea, which are like um, they're a form of uh, microbiological organism, which produce methane as they break down the grass and other food. And that produces methane, which the cattle or sheep then burp up. So uh, pigs and poultry and humans don't produce much methane, uh, but the ruminants, that's uh, cattle, sheep, uh, goats, uh, wild deer, they all produce uh, a significant amount of methane. Thank you very much. Colin is asking, um, does CO2 from diet depend on weight of the individual and would cutting down on the prevalence of obesity impact on target emissions? <laughs> Yes, it would. Um, if you, you could regard obesity as a form of food waste because we're eating food that doesn't do us any good. And in fact, uh, we're wasting a lot of that. You know, a lot of the stuff that we don't convert into fat, we're wasting uh, when we go to the toilet. 
So that is another form of food waste away. So just the, the, the amount that we need and not over consuming um, uh, would help significantly, mainly not at the individual level, um, but at the sort of community level by having uh, less obesity in the system, we're healthier and we also reduce the uh, emissions from food waste. Thank you very much. Um, apologies, my cat keeps making an appearance. Uh, sorry. Nice, to um, nice to see him. He's not alone, <laughs> by the way. So the let's see. The next question is: do, oh, Sorry, what diet do you follow? And in order to eat enough protein, are we able to grow enough pulses and nuts in this country? And they said, or if these foods have to be imported, what will that impact be if we increase the numbers eating them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the personal question first, uh, I've been a vegetarian since 1989. I stopped eating meat um, back in 1989, but that was for nothing to do with climate change. I didn't work on climate change and I didn't know anything about the climate impacts. So I stopped eating meat mainly for animal welfare reasons. But last year, at the beginning of last year, I also stopped eating meat and dairy. And that's as a direct result of the evidence that I've found in doing my work. And I thought, I can't be talking about that sort of stuff. I can't be giving talks like this if I'm not practicing what I preach. So I packed in um, my beloved cheese, which I loved, but I've given it up now. And milk, I now use oat milk, um, which I've got used to really quickly. Um, so, but I still eat um, the odd egg. We've got three pet chickens and I still eat eggs from the pet chickens. So I, I can't badge myself as a, as a vegan, but I tried to cut out livestock products um, in, order to, in order to fit in, to sort of practice what I preach in a way. And the other part of the question was, sorry? Part of the question was um, and in order to eat enough protein are we able to grow enough pulses and nuts in this country or if these foods have to be imported what will that impact be if we increase the numbers eating them yeah that's a great question um we don't have to replace protein we we, we currently in in developed countries we currently overeat protein by about 80 to 100 percent so we can drastically reduce the amount of um, animal products that we consume without undermining uh, the amount of uh, the amount of protein that we get in our diet to have it had it had beans and lentils things like that produce um, have a lot of protein in in fact all uh, cereals um, you know uh, wheat that you use in bread has a lot of protein in it um, so people tend to think of protein as synonymous with meat or meat sort of substitutes and things like that. But actually, there's a lot of meat. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of protein in the vegetable products that we eat. So we can safely reduce that by um, 100 percent. In fact, not only really safely, it would be more healthy for us to reduce that overconsumption of protein and we wouldn't have to replace it with other things. I think the, the, the question about like if we replace milk, um, so I, I choose oat milk and you can grow oat milk, um, you can grow oats in this sort of climate on poor, poor ground in quite cold and wet land. If you chose to replace uh, your, your milk with almond milk, for example, that's imported from California, where they use a lot of pesticides and they have industrial bees uh, uh, pollination to produce it, then the environmental impact isn't as good. So it's not automatic that um, uh, your place alternatives are going to have less environmental impact. You also have to think carefully about where they're sourced. Um, Julian's asking, what about trees and livestock, um, which is agroforestry, might work in north of Scotland? Yeah, so agroforestry thing that's sort of fallen out of favour. Um, it's something that's got quite a potential to increase carbon stocks without um, without sort of undermining the productivity of the grassland. If you look back a sort of a few hundred years, there are a lot more trees and hedges in the landscape, 
but they've gradually been taken out uh, to make room for um, to make room as we've mechanized agriculture it makes it easier to get into the fields but putting those trees back would sequester carbon as those trees grow they take carbon out of the atmosphere they also provide shelter which is better for animal welfare not so much up in Scotland for providing shelter from the sun but providing shelter from the from the wind and the rain so I think putting more trees back into livestock landscapes is a good thing, um, but it could also be done in more arable landscapes, as is being done in France, where they use alley cropping, uh, where they use shelter belts of trees with uh, uh, arable cropping in between them. And that's being trialled in a few places to try and get more trees back into the landscape. Leslie said, I'm interested in the impact assessment of plant based products. Monoculture plant production has devastated Asian forests, is a contributor to the Amazon destruction, is causing a lot of issues with water quality, and is destroying insect life and has a whole range of pesticide and fertilizer issues. Yet you give it such a clean bill of health. Yeah, well, I don't give it a clean bill of health. There, as I said before, there are there are really bad ways of doing uh, plant based agriculture. Um, so if you look at the oil palms that are being planted on tropical peatlands, you know, I've done some work there. We've got a few projects out there. Absolutely devastating for biodiversity, for water quality and dreadful for the climate because those big carbon carbon stocks in the peatlands um, are lost within the space of uh, years to decades huge pulses of carbon coming out of those systems so there are examples of really really bad plant agriculture um which it's not like an either or it's not either reduce you know it's not you if you reduce your livestock product consumption you necessarily have to start buying products from those devastating ecological disasters as well you can reduce your livestock product consumption. And I think you should also be avoiding the products that come from those sort of production systems. I think government's got more of a role to play in certifying those 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 sort of systems so that the, the foods that we get in this country can be certified to be coming from sustainable sources. There's some amount of that going on, but that needs to be better. Anastasia says on that point, um, but surely the same thing happens when farming animals, a monoculture of grass to feed cattle and sheep. Yeah, that can be that can that can also occur. I, I think the most the, the, the least natural systems I've seen are the feedlot systems in the US where animals don't they're, they're basically landless systems where all the food is brought in for them. So they're largely corn fed, so it's maize that are fed to them to the animals and you get it's really bad for welfare you know they have to um they use growth hormones in those systems and they also um uh, they also have to give them uh, antibiotics because they're kept so close together that, that it's, it's not good for welfare it's not good for the environment so grass-fed beef is somewhere it's in somewhere in between whilst it's um not great for the because of the methane emissions if it's done well for example, if you've got biodiverse grasslands um, and you allow them to grow a diverse mix of plants in the grasses, they can actually be good for biodiversity. And remember in Scotland, there are large parts of the land that are too wet or too cold to use for crop production. So the best way to get um, best way to get human edible protein from the land, or the least worst way, I should say, in terms of the environment, is to use to produce um, produce products from that land and if that's done carefully and sustainably and I know there are people on the call that do this um, then that can be done uh, in, in, in a more environmentally benign way so again it's not an, everybody has to steep, stop eating livestock and we'll have no livestock in the system at all and we drive all livestock farmers and dairy farmers out of business it's just to say that we need to consume less. We need to have less, less livestock head in this country, in the UK generally, in fact. And we should be going for a, a, a less and more model for meat and livestock products, which I think we should also, it also implies the cheapest, lowest common denominator food, 
where the farmers aren't really rewarded because they don't get the don't get the money from the the the, the supermarkets uh, because we as consumers aren't willing to pay that. I think that needs to be rebalanced so that we can produce our food in a fair and sustainable way. Um, Ken is asking, why, how do beef and sheep use so much more energy than crops and in what form? Is it slaughtering compared to crop drying, etc.? Yeah, so that's that largely to do with the um, the housing. So that varies greatly. You would see big error bars on that. So some livestock systems lose use less energy. Um, the grass fed, especially if, if the animals are finished grass, they use a lot less energy than the animals that are uh, fed uh, and have to be um, in housed over the winter. So that's there's a there's a big error bar on that, or I should say a big variation in that, but that's largely due to the components which are to do with um, uh, the housing, but also in the energy that's used in the food production, because a lot of animals aren't fed only on grass, they're also fed on concentrates, which have, you know, have to be ploughed and they have to be sown and they have to be harvested and that all uses uh, fossil fuels and energy. Iona is asking, what about sheep production on land that is not available for other agriculture, such as hill country? Well, you have to ask that land used for agriculture. I think a lot of that land was cleared um, and used for livestock farming, used for sheep farming in the uplands. We know that we've got a lot of overgrazing and a lot of the biodiversity has been driven off and those like those landscapes have been denuded by sheep over a number of years, uh, centuries in fact. So that's not really the natural system. We look at that and we say, what happens, what can we do on that land other than raise sheep? Well, probably in terms of agriculture, not much. For restoring those for biodiversity, there's quite a lot we can do. So I'd say that um, those systems, some of the some of the some of the uplands can be used for grazing. There's a lot of those that are uneconomic, and they're only there because of um, subsidies that were existing under the Common Agricultural Policy. But after EU exit, we no longer have that Common Agricultural Policy, and that gives us a chance to reimagine what we want the landscape to look like. At the same time, safeguarding the rural livelihoods upon which those communities. Well, apologies, it was breaking up for me there. I couldn't hear the end of it there. So we'll hit the next one. There's been so many good comments as well, but um, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm looking for the questions specifically. Um, David is asking, what about GWP? Right, this is going to be quite complex to go into. It comes back to the, um, it comes back to that question about how long does does methane last in the atmosphere? It lasts for about 12 years. So livestock farmers in particular think that it's unfair that it's measured over a hundred year timescale. So this is something called the global warming potential. And if you use a global warming potential over a hundred years, the impact of methane appears larger than it does if you use another metric called GWP star. Um, GWP star is based more on the rate of emissions rather than the actual emission, rather than the total amount of emissions. So this is going to be, get a little bit involved for the majority of people on the call, I think. So it's going to be difficult to explain. But the bottom line is, is as I said earlier, methane is a potent greenhouse gas, but whichever way you measure it. We need to reduce methane emissions from the livestock sector, as well as from the fossil fuel industry and everywhere else, um, whichever way you measure it. And because it's a short-lived greenhouse gas, I think that it's a, a, a sensible time. Early action. And the Committee on Climate Change thinks this too. So um, the Committee on Climate 
it's recommend recommend says we need to reduce some studies suggest that it needs to be up to 50 percent by 2050 if we're to get to net zero Thank you very much. Apologies if I'm pausing too long. It, it, it's dipping in and out for me a little bit, so I'm, I'm not just ignoring you. <laughs> um, let's see. The next question is from Samantha. And they ask, what about CO2 production from importing fruit and veg? Yeah, so I answered this already earlier. Um, the the, the um, climate footprint of foods, only a tiny proportion of that is related to the transport. If you air freight in um, goods, then the, the, the climate impact can be very high, but only a tiny, for, only a tiny fraction of food that comes into this country is air freighted. Most of it is shipped, and because it's shipped in bulk um, on very big ships, um, the climate footprint of that transport is is relatively low. So again, because of the life cycle, because the majority of the emissions come from uh, the production side of growing plants or raising animals, this transport component is relative. That's why I think for climate reasons, the, the buy local thing has been overstated. There are millions of reasons why we should buy local. So I always buy local, as I said earlier, because it supports the local economy, et cetera, et cetera. But climate change is not a very big one of those. Um, Amanda is asking, what effect would reduction of livestock farming have on organic fertilizer availability for arable farming? Yeah, so we use... Um, uh, animal manure for fertilization of a lot of our gra grazing land. So the question that's being asked is, if we don't have those animals, do we then no longer have the manure? The answer is yes, we'd have less manure. But remember, these don't, the, the animals don't magically make the nitrogen. The nitrogen that's in the manure is just concentrated by the animals. It's already available in the plant material and when the when the animals eat them, they just concentrate that nitrogen, which is then found in the manure, which, why it's such a good fertilizer. In stock free systems, you tend to have a period where you have uh, legumes which are either under sown with the crops or inter sown with the crops. Or you have a period where you have one or two years in a diverse legume rich, uh, uh, legume rich, rich mix of plants. Legumes are types of plants that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So when they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, you plant those and you can get some of the nitrogen that you would otherwise get from your from your animal agriculture. Having said that, one of the one of the pinch points when we did that analysis of can we feed the world organically, when we did that analysis, one of the pinch points was nitrogen. It was the provision of that nitrogen fertilizer. You can reduce the animal numbers so far, in fact, to about 20% of those that we currently consume, and you've still got enough nitrogen. If you go 100% vegan, then you've got to start taking a lot of other measures if you take the, if you take the animals out of the system entirely. That's a good question. Thank you very much. Um, Helen's asking, is anyone looking for the methane from ruminants. Uh, was that to reduce methane from ruminants? Did I hear uh, that correctly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, to, a way to, um, to sequester the methane. Yeah, so, so um, yes, they have looked at that. So there are a few people looking at dietary additives. So garlic is a dietary additive that reduces methane emissions. And they are, there are some other compounds called propionate precursors and ionophores, which are scientific sort of additives to the diets, which can also reduce methane a bit. Now, the last time I looked at the studies um, on most of those that were being developed up to about five years ago, you got a, a reduction of about 20% methane emissions, but that only lasted for a few weeks. 
because the gut uh, microflora adapts to the to the to the the new regime, and the methane methane emissions return to close to their former levels after two or three weeks. So it's not a long term solution. However, there are some others in development which give more, um, which it's early stages yet, but they seem to give more um, uh, a longer lasting and regular uh, reduction in methane emissions. So I think it's some science that's worth doing. Um, uh, with it is, is how do animals if you've got if you've got animals that are fed indoors if you've got a, a sort of a land free system and i think grazed uh, grass fed ruminants are more ecologically sustainable if you're using those systems it's much more difficult to get those uh, methane reduction, re reducing components into the diet because the animals are out grazing all the time and you don't have a concentrated feed to put them in. So there's that problem too about how, how do we make sure we can get these to, into animals. Um, you don't really want to be spraying your whole field uh, with sort of products that reduce methane emissions. You know, that probably research apologies for breaking up again for me there sorry hey. it's not the best connection um so uh, Clyde is actually there are apparently food additives which reduce methane production in ruminants does do these work Uh, so that's that's the answer I just gave, I think. Oh, sorry, was it? Apologies. Um, let me just move down. I couldn't hear your last answer, so I got a bit mixed up with the question. Um, let me see. I'm getting a lot of love for my cat. Thank you, everyone. Um, his name is Bolin, his little Mark Bolin. Um, <laughs> thank you for your with regards to him. He's given up on us now, unfortunately. Um, so the next one is from Ken. It says, why the stress on peatlands um, versus Scottish, of course, sorry, um, Scottish, of course, but not much farmed livestock thereon. And like, and like grass, more a stock than a flow. Are you including, for example, Russian tundra? So again, little farm livestock there. Yeah, so this is more to of the land this is um, largely managed for shooting estates so we have a lot of land that we do muir burn on for example um, we, and otherwise we drain them for for better shooting conditions so this doesn't affect agriculture this affects more the shooting estates where the peatlands are degraded through um, through use for shooting estates and um, we could there, 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 therefore restore them um, some some peats and organo mineral soils, so shallow peats, are in fact used for grazing. So a lot of the degraded peats that we see in the north of Scotland are on uh, shallow peats or what's called organo mineral soils, and these contain a lot of carbon that is lost. So restoring those to some to some extent uh, could, could increase our carbon sink, increase our carbon sinks, and switch off the ongoing emissions because the emissions from degraded peatlands are very high about up to 30 tons of co2 per year per hectare so they're a really significant source of emissions which we could uh, stop by better manage managing them thank you very much um, mike is asking on the note of cats and dogs i assume that their diet and having one because they eat a lot of meat could be quite a contribution to the CO2 CH4 of the average household. It is. Um, there was a bloke in uh, Australia, a, a scientist, who did that calculation about what do our what do our pets, domestic pets, contribute to climate change, and it's quite a significant amount. 
Um, having said that, a lot of the um, a lot of the pet food uh, into pet feed are actually waste products from other components of the um, from the meat system. So they tend to get the you know the uh, less good meat of the, the meat that wouldn't go for you. So it depends how you allocate that. You might say they're just feeding they're just feeding on waste products that would otherwise get wasted. So um, they're not a problem. Uh, but the other way of looking at that is that they are a component of of um, of, of of the emissions. So whilst I've decided to stop eating livestock products, my cat still does. So I take your point. Um, Marie is asking, what do you suggest for small scale Scottish beef farmers who are already implementing carbon footprint measures such as cattle feed, which produces less methane? I think it's great. It's a step in the right direction. So I think this, as I said, I hope I got across in the in the thing, this is not a war on uh, beef for dairy farmers or sheep producers. Um, this is a recognition that there is a contribution to climate change and that we need to eat less of those products. That doesn't mean that there will be no products in the system. I think we're gonna we're gonna be continuing to eat meat into the future. But I think the industry will look smaller and different um, in a few years' time, especially if this carbon tax comes in that's being talked about today. Um, it will change the way that the system, this is designed to reduce consumption of livestock products, this carbon tax. That's its aim. And if it does, then that means there's going to be a smaller sector in the future. But my, my view is that um, if we're going to be producing meat and dairy, if we're going to be producing sheep, that we should be producing them in the most environmentally benign way. So I think, you know, the, the organic systems, systems where um, uh, you're, you're trying to use as much grass fed material, where you're using uh, concentrates which don't rely on soy imported from Brazil, you know, which has a very, very big climate impact abroad, where we're trying to you know, that's where we've got to go. So we all have to set forward uh, in baby steps, I think we've all we've all got to make progress. Um, that includes the industry and us as individual consumers. Thank you very much. And um, Catherine is asking. I'm getting feedback. <laughs> I'll start again. Um, do you feel the government are doing or going to do enough to really make a difference to policies and what people have available to consume in the supermarkets? I don't know the answer. Um, we'll have to see what happens. I think there will be um, carbon taxes will be controversial, not least because people don't like being told what they should eat. Um, so a carbon tax is one way of nudging people in the direction that the government wants them to go uh, and the science says that we must go so i think those carbon taxes are a nudge but they could be could be controversial not only because people don't like being told what to eat and being being interfered with by the government but also because there are some social justice and equity issues associated with that we know that the poorest people in society in scotland already have the worst diets so maybe by introducing a carbon tax, we actually um, force worse diets upon those people uh, that are already relying on food banks that are already in fairly non-diverse and poor diets. So there has to be some that goes in to any measures that implement it. One way that you, you could imagine it happening is if you raise money uh, from a carbon tax, on products such as meat and dairy, you could subsidise fresh fruit and bananas, and 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 other fresh fruit and vegetables and all the, all these other things, so that people have better, more economic access to those products. It has to be thought about carefully, but you could imagine ways in which uh, the 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 tax raised by the carbon tax be distributed to make it fair and equitable. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, Anastasia is asking, should there be a meat tax like the sugar tax? Well, the meat tax would, would actually be, uh, it would be a de facto meat if we introduced a carbon tax. Because as I showed in the slides, the climate impact of meat and dairy is so much greater than that of plant-based foods that when you apply a carbon tax, it would disproportionately apply uh, to ruminant-based products in particular, but all meats to some extent. So you would see that meats got more expensive and dairy would get more expensive and other animal products would get a little more expensive compared, compared to plant-based foods. So a carbon tax would have that effect. It would be in effect a meat and dairy tax, uh, but not, it wouldn't be applied only to meat and dairy, but it'd be a, applied um, uh, in proportion to the climate impact, which would mean that they were more expensive. So in a way, if uh, if that comes in, if that's and that's being seriously discussed by number ten at the moment, that could it impact the food system in a way in in such a way as a meat tax would. Great. Um, Anne is asking, what about privately owned estates in Scotland, where owners have removed all the trees, allowed too many deer to be there for making money out of shooting? Yeah, well, environmentally, that's that's a um, <laughs> that's not the best way to use the land, is it? So I would say that um, any uh, revised system for for support, um, you know, that a lot of these estates have been receiving large amounts of public money um, to do this through the Common Agricultural Policy, which is on a sort of a per hectare basis. Um, that could be realigned. I think that the um, uh, the, the systems in the future have to be aligned to environmental management and public goods for public money for public goods rather. So the public goods that are provided by the land have to be um, at the centre of our thinking when we devise a new system uh, of subsidies for landowners and land management. Um, Emma is asking, are we heading in the direction of lab grown meat eventually overtaking meat consumption? What do you think of the technology? Uh, we could be, um, uh, but I don't think we will, because I go back to an earlier an earlier response that we currently over consume protein by about 80 to 100 percent. Uh, and meat consumption, we're not sort of desperately thinking, well, I need to get that protein from somewhere else. We know that we currently over consume it. So we could reduce our protein consumption significantly without having to eat insects, without having to eat uh, plant uh, lab based meat. Um, lab based meat, I think, doesn't float my boat particularly as an individual uh, because. Uh, um, I don't know. That's just my 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 personal my personal view. I don't think I would like to eat it, but maybe there are there are those that that that, that do. Um, it's not um, for those that like to know where their food comes from and know that it's natural. Those are not the sort of people that would be attracted to lab-based meats. But the technology is coming on quite. And I don't. I have no no doubt that within about ten years we'll probably be able to have some lab grown meat that looks uh, pretty much like uh, muscle muscle material that will be probably sold, so, uh, served up to the public. I don't think it's economically viable yet, but the technology is certainly there. So let's see what happens. I don't know the answer. Thank you very much. Um, Ruth, Lorna and Richard are asking, what is different about the New Zealand production processes? Uh, well, there's, there's not, not much really. Um, uh, in New Zealand, uh, if you're talking about New Zealand lamb and Scottish lamb, it's pretty similar. You've got a similar climate. You've got um, uh, similar sort of production systems. 
the lowland systems tend to use a lot of fertilizer to fertilize the pastures to get the grass growing a lot um, growing quickly so they have a lot of problems um, in some areas with nitrate leaching and the eutrophication you know the pollution of water bodies so it's by no means the sort of the <laughs> the clean green industry that it sometimes portrays itself as uh, but we have lowland lowland farmers that do similar uh, similar with with um, uh, fertilization of grasslands. So it's, there's nothing, there's, there aren't massively big differences between sheep production in New Zealand and sheep production in uh, in Scotland. I think to a large extent, they're shooting at the same market. They're shooting at the market of um, buy, uh, buy, buy um, Scottish lamb or buy New Zealand lamb because it's clean, green, it's grass fed, it's good for you and wholesome. I think they're largely shooting for the same market. Thank you. Um, Anne is asking, what do you think is the most environmentally and climate friendly non-dairy milk? The one that I choose is um, an oat-based milk. Um, and I choose that because it's um, it doesn't taste too bad, unlike some of the others. <laughs> um, and you can get I get used to it really quickly. Actually, it only took me about a couple of months before I got used to it, and I now prefer it to um, uh, sort of dairy milk. I wouldn't like the taste of dairy milk anymore. Um, and I choose it because it's it's something that we can grow in this climate, so it reduces the amount of uh, food miles. I mentioned that food miles isn't a very great component of it, but we can also grow it fairly effectively with not too much, uh, not too much fertilisation, uh, not too much herbicide and pesticide. Um, Scotland's famous for oats, so we can grow oats here really well, and in this sort of climate. So I prefer to be getting my oats from oat milk and my oat, oat milk rather from oats, rather than the, my um, uh, Milk, milk substitute from almonds and other things that are imported from different climates all over the place where I know that for example in California they're, they're, uh, they're, that's a pretty intensive unenvironmentally friendly way that they're grown. So I use Only which is a Swedish company. Thank you. We'll go for one more, we've just got time for one more. Um, Marion asked, if we have to in import more food, is this not worrying from a food security problem? Well, you might be worried uh, already um, because we currently uh, import around about 48% of our food anyway. So we're by no by means um, uh, sort of um, uh, self-sufficient within, within the UK or Scotland. So we already import 48% of our food. And if there'll be no point in reducing our consumption of livestock products by closing down dairy farms and beef farms and sheep farms here, and then importing them from abroad. That would just be exporting our environmental impact. And probably it would have a, a higher climate footprint and a higher environmental impact from outside. That's why I think uh, we need a system where we as consumers, we reduce our consumption, and that would feed through into the system rather than just closing down farms or punishing farmers in some way and driving them out of business. Because if there was still the demand there, we would just buy those products. So it's we as consumers who have to change, um, not just the industry. We shouldn't be targeting the industry. Thank you very much, Pete. I've got to say, this has been absolutely the most um, interactive chat we've ever had at any of these events so far. Um, lots of really good comments, um, uh, lots of really good points people have made. I would uh, definitely encourage you, Pete, to have a scroll through the chat um, when we're finished. You can see what everyone's been saying uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. Um, and also just uh, I would say a big thank you to everyone for, for coming along today um, and thank you for your patience with any connection issues. This is the, the joy that we have when we're trying to host everything um, virtually and just hoping that the, the internet plays ball on the day that we're, we're doing it. 
Um, so we really appreciate you guys sticking with us um, if you had any any trouble at all. And um, a huge thank you to you, Pete, for spending your time with us this afternoon. It's an absolutely fascinating, very thought provoking. Um, and we're very grateful for your time. So thank you. No problem. Cheers. It was interesting questions. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everyone, again. And um, come and join us at another one of our events soon. You can check out our events page. And um, apart from that, have a lovely evening. Thank you.